All right, welcome to season two, episode eight of Education in Color. Today, I am joined by a very special guest, and as you can tell by the gear, it's uh, my alma mater, City College's president, President Vincent Budro. Real pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And um, you know, I just want to dive right into the first question. And sure. it's funny. I, I just want to like break the fourth wall for a second. When I was interviewing Carol, like, I, if you look at the episode, I was jittery. I was nervous. But then now I feel like I could talk about it. That way I won't be jittery and nervous for this one. No, so, you're a veteran. That's right. <laughs> thank you. And the first question I want to ask is, how was your educational experience growing up and your relationship to school in general? Oh, well, you know, so my father was a professor at Lemoyne College. In fact, um, that's where I did my college education. And I was in a freshman honors program with 12 students, and he taught freshman honors writing. So the very first classroom I ever walked into as a college student was my father's, was my father's class. But you know, we, I had, grew up in a big family, seven brothers and sisters, um, and education was everything for us. You know, we, we thought of his college as a place where we would go to play. Like when it snowed, they had a hill, we would sled there. Right. We would go in, we knew all the faculty, they would come over. And so education was, was, was very, very important to, to us. We all went to public school. Um, I'm the second of seven. So my brother uh, went to Harvard, I went to Lemoyne College, but all of my siblings were, were you know, good in, in, in school and, 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 and went to college. There was really, never a question in my family, but that education was going to be in our future. And um, quick question, because my geography isn't the best, but where is Lemoyne College? Oh, it's up in Syracuse. That's where I grew up. Oh, okay, so upstate New York. Yeah, upstate New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're the other college in Syracuse was Lemoyne College. Uh -huh. uh, for me, it was public sector stuff, like or public schooling all throughout my you know, yeah. upbringing as well. How did you feel going through the public school system in upstate New York? You know, it, so I grew up in a suburb. Mm. And I was going to school in the 1970s where, you know, our public schools were probably better than the parochial schools at the mm. time. Up, up where I grew up, you could go primarily to Catholic school or you would go to public school. The, the whole charter school movement didn't exist. Mm. So I had public school teachers that were, you know, from the get go dedicated and they they figured out like if they if they saw that you had an interest in one thing or another mm -hmm. they would they would pull you out of it i remember you know even as third grade there were like five of us little kids that were interested in star trek and so we had a, <laughs> yeah. we had an art teacher who said all right we're gonna next semester we're gonna do a star trek play and mm -hmm. you're gonna write it and you're gonna design the set and they they built she built the curriculum around our interests and um you know, same thing. I, I think our school started a model rocket club because a bunch of us were interested in model rockets. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that kind of attention to where students are, class sizes were small, like mm -hmm. 25 students in a class. So um, I have no complaints about, about the education I, I got up in, in, in Syracuse. That's pretty cool about the Star Trek, especially because um, for me, my third grade experience was the teacher would just say, don't huff too much glue. There was a certain extent where she'd be like, ah, whatever, he's just huffing glue or whatever. But after that, it was like, no, no more. You know, it's, <laughs> it's like I didn't I grew up in a mm -hmm. in a working class suburban suburb. Like it, um, I, I, I remember looking at uh, the apartment I live in right now is a thousand square feet. And just mm -hmm. for fun, I went and looked at the square footage of the house I grew up in mm -hmm. nine people thousand square feet oh. so we were you know we were uh, we were a working class suburb and and in the united states you know, you know the tax base of public school has so much to do with the quality of education you get right, right? so if you live in a super affluent suburb there's a lot of tax money that goes to the to the public schools there I can't believe that we had a, a particularly large tax base. Mm -hmm. um, I know, like, I mean, our next door neighbor man was a manager of the grocery store. Guy across the street drove a bus, you <laughs> yeah. know. But our schools were terrific, and I think it was just that what it meant to be a school teacher. Um, probably the level of compensation you got as, as in in school was just it was just different back then. Mm -hmm. And going along the topic of education, I want to ask, being the president of City College right now, what specific initiatives have you uh, implemented to foster diversity and inclusivity within the campus? So one of the things that we noticed coming into this job was that um, 
So we're in the middle of Harlem. We identify as a Harlem institution. We didn't get very many students from Harlem. Hmm. You know, our students, we got the most students from Queens and Westchester <laughs> and yeah. the Bronx and then a little bit of Manhattan. Um, and that meant that we had to build relationships with the mm -hmm. schools in this area. We got great schools in the area, you know, Eagle Academy, um, which is where our school's chancellor came mm -hmm. out of um, as, as a principal. Um, you know, all around here, there are there are terrific schools. And so we took a little bit of philanthropic money that we had mm -hmm. and we hired someone into our admissions office whose specific task was to go to these area schools and build relationships with guidance counselors. And mm -hmm. what we discovered in those relationships is that the relationship between City College and the guidance counselors in these local schools mm -hmm. almost didn't exist. Oh, I and see. so we had to rebuild those, mm -hmm. those those relationships as well. You know this as a City College alum. Mm -hmm. um, uh, creating diversity in our student body on this campus hasn't historically been a problem for mm -hmm. us, right? Um, uh, about 18% of our population, 18 to 20% historically identify as white. Everybody else is 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 something else. Mm -hmm. You know, about thirty six percent of our students are Latinos, twenty five percent African Americans, and 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 down the line. My concern has been not how do I build a diverse community on this campus. Mm -hmm. It's been who are we leaving behind? Who are we overlooking in the communities? You know, I've I've been president for seven years, but I've been you know I was hired at City College in nineteen ninety one. So I was like seven years before I was born. I was doing the math. <laughs> right, exactly. So this is my thirty-second uh -huh. year on campus, and and one of the things that was so clear to me as a classroom teacher is students enter our classroom every day, yeah. not believing that they actually belong at City College or not knowing that they're smart, mm -hmm. and and so talking about and thinking about imposter syndrome, and in a classroom like identifying the guy in the back of the room who you may think doesn't want to be there mm -hmm. and identifying that behavior as shyness and insecurity as opposed to indifference or, 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 or disengagement is, is really important. And so on this campus, we talk about that all the time. Mm -hmm. We talk about, you know, if we're missing somebody in Harlem who could succeed here, and we're missing them because we're not identifying that talent, then that's a problem for our institution. Mm -hmm. We've also, I will say, we've also built really strong relationships with the community. So I'm currently the chair of the Harlem Chamber of Commerce's Education Committee. Mm -hmm. um, and that means working pretty closely with the Department of Education, it means working very closely with the Harlem School District, District 5. Mm -hmm. Um, and that redounds to the benefit of this campus as, as well. And then we have all kinds of bridge programs uh, on campus. Uh, STEM Institute, where you know, you, you'll actually, if you go out today, you'll see young people, high school and, mm -hmm. and younger, wearing STEM Institute shirts. Oh, that's the crowd that I saw. <laughs> yeah. For a second, I was like, what, what are all these people doing over here? So those uh -huh. are people from the community, largely Washington Heights, mm -hmm. but not limited to who are spending the summer in laboratories and robotics classes getting ready for the next step, oh, which is dope. college. Mm -hmm. and, and we expect a lot of them to be city college students. And you can go department by department, school by school, and find similar bridge programs where we're reaching out to young people to prepare them for a city college education. Mm -hmm. So it's two things, right? It's, it's making sure that people in this community understand that this college is a place for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll do one more story. When when mm -hmm. when we first started, so I came into the presidency in late 2016 as interim. 2017, we were thinking, well, what are we going to do at City College to to make make to have a little bit of fun? Because mm -hmm. I was an interim, I was going to go back to being dean. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do like one fun thing yeah. as president, and Halloween was coming along, and you know we have these kind of semi-secret tunnels underground mm -hmm. that connect all of the yeah, old yeah. buildings. And a lot of those tunnels have, you know, some of the old gargoyles, mm -hmm. the original gargoyles in them in storage. So we thought, well, what if we spread the gargoyles through the tunnels mm -hmm. and get the drama program to do like a haunted house? And we do a haunted house on, at Halloween. Mm -hmm. And the first year we did it just for fun. But what we saw was on Halloween night, mothers and fathers with five-year-old kids, 10-year-old mm -hmm. kids, 12-year-old kids were bringing their children to City College for Halloween. Um, 
and the next year we repeated it, there was more of that community participation. Mm -hmm. and, and it became important to us because if a 10 year old kid can see City College as a place that they can go to, then they're gonna come to us as college students. Mm. And the more into the community you go, the more times you hear people say, I never thought City College was for me. You know, I grew up in the shadow of City College, mm -hmm. but it always felt like that was inaccessible. And so anything we can do to be involved with the community, to bring community members up to campus to recreate mm -hmm. um, is going to build not just diversity, but our relationship with our most proximate community, which is Harlem. And that's a community that, that, that has need. Um, we also have partnerships with groups like Silicon Harlem and, you know, Harlem Week, mm -hmm. all of which are, are, are doing things that engage children. During Harlem Week, we have a hackathon that's sponsored by Silicon Harlem mm. on campus. And we make the point to the young you know, boys and girls engaged in that, that if you had fun here today, imagine how much fun you'll have as a college student right. coming to campus. So all of those things kind of work together to build a diverse community that's that's a college that is proximate to its local community and that's really important mm -hmm. to us you know i, I want to focus on two points that you mentioned one being the haunted house uh -huh. and once you brought that up halloween is my favorite holiday uh -huh. but then i remember exactly that haunted house i went <laughs> yeah so it's funny when you said uh you were the interim president in 20, late 2016 i started at city college in the fall of 2016. right so then when that haunted house came i was also looking for a haunted house but I was like, i'm not trying to go out to like amityville or like somewhere like super super far yep. so when i saw something that was local i was like oh screw it why not yeah we did it Literally, we did it because um, I was interim president for 13 months, mm -hmm. meaning when it came around to June, July, we were all expecting to go back. I was going to go back and be a dean. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my senior advisor was going to go back and work with me at the Colin Powell School. Mm -hmm. And we said, you know, maybe and it, it was, you know, that was. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were here. Those were some tough months for City yeah. College, right? We had a rocky leadership transition, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of anger on campus. Mm -hmm. And so we're at the back end of that. We thought, well, could we do just one thing that's fun? Mm -hmm. Could we leave one mark on the campus that's fun? What's interesting about a college campus is if you do something, so we did it for the first year in 2017, mm -hmm. we did it again in 2018. By 2019, the students in the drama department that did the, like that would do the haunted house, mm -hmm. they all believed that it was a tradition Oh. <laughs> stretching back for yeah. 30 years. So there's no way we can stop doing a haunted house mm -hmm. now because because now our student community mm -hmm. has all grown up at a time when City College did haunted house on Halloween. So we're really thrilled about that. Um, but every year, facilities people, they go out and mm -hmm. they buy decorations with their own money. Mm -hmm. um, students in the drama program, they all, you know, they write the script and they practice and mm -hmm. they, they, they put it on and student government works with us as well. So it's a very cool thing. So what I'm hearing is I'm going to have to come back this October for yeah. Halloween and film. <laughs> Everybody should come back for Halloween at City College. Perfect. So what that means, guys, come over here for the Haunted House October 31st, right? Halloween night. There you go. Yep. And um, the other point I wanted to mention before moving on to the next question was you said that you started to strengthen the communal ties you have in the Harlem community and that you had a lot of people coming from other boroughs. You mentioned Queens, which is funny because for me, that's the borough I was commuting from. Yeah. And I don't know what it was, but in my brain, I had it like on um, autopilot to where I'd sleep on the train and wake up exactly at 125th or 145th Street uh -huh. when the doors would open. Yep. But um, I, I see what you mean with the communal building and actually building that community, because since I've um, or since I graduated and what have you, I noticed that you guys are starting to do a lot more activities, a lot more ventures into the actual Harlem community mm -hmm. to garner more support from them and then have their students start early, you know? Think about college from when they're in elementary school, middle school, looking at what programs they have over here that yeah. entice them. Yeah, it's not just getting support from them, mm. right? If you think about the bigger mission of City College and of all the CUNY schools, our big mission is social justice, right? right? It's equity. And so we need to be aligned with our community on those issues. So we have sponsored, you know, anti-gun violence rallies mm -hmm. with a, a fantastic community group called Harlem Mothers Save. Um, when, when the Trump administration was new mm -hmm. and there was all these threats against immigrants, we partnered again in demonstrations with, with uh, members of the Harlem community to mm -hmm. say, this is not the New York that we, that we want. Um, and then, and then even beyond that, 
you know, for instance, climate change is a huge issue, particularly in communities of color. You know, you see, you know, the smoke, the heat mm -hmm. islands, the flooding from these latest storms. We've got vast resources in climate change in our sciences and in our engineering mm -hmm. school. Those resources need to be made available to our communities. And so just a quick example, um, the engineering school, some of the students have these little heat sensors that mm -hmm. they go out into the community and they'll put them at the bottom of the building, at the top of the building, so that they can figure out if, if you know, if grandma is on the 15th floor oh, and it's 110 degrees up there, mm -hmm. she's in bad shape, even if on the ground it's 91 degrees mm -hmm. and the, the weather department says it's 91. So we put these these sensors all over upper Manhattan and do a couple of things. We use that data mm -hmm. to inform the city where there might be danger spots. But also as we put those sensors out, our students are putting those sensors out. Young people on the street will come up and say, well, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. and they'll say, well, this is a heat sensor. Well, what's a heat sensor? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you wanted to be a, an environmental engineer, mm -hmm. this would be really important to you. So it's another way of, of making the resources of the college available mm -hmm. to the community. And that's that's super important to me. Oh, that's dope, man. Yeah. And um, you know, on the topic of equity, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this because next thing you know, you'd be like, wait, you work for Menteach, why didn't you mention it? Yeah. I want to ask you, what are your thoughts on the New York City Menteach program here at City College? Oh, I think it's a great program. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, what, what people don't know about education at City College, we had developed um, in the 1920s, mm we had developed the very first curriculum that was problematizing this idea of how do you bring education to urban communities, mm -hmm. and particularly at that time, um, African-American communities in, in, in New York City. Mm -hmm. So the, I, the, the mission of, of Men Teach and the way it's being delivered at City College, it actually taps into a history and a tradition mm -hmm. at CCNY where we recognize that, that without specific focus, we're gonna lose First of all, young men mm -hmm. who may have a vocation for teaching, but nobody sort of tapped them on the shoulder and said, you should right. do this. Um, now, this goes back to what I was saying about imposter syndrome. If, if w with our student demographic, mm -hmm. there's so much talent where if somebody doesn't tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, you know what, you, mm -hmm. I, I've listened to how you talk in class, you'd be a great teacher. You could graduate never thinking that anyone noticed right. that you've got this gift. And so I think what the, one of the things the Men Teach program does is it makes young men who have particular vocation for teaching mm -hmm. aware of that and, and, and then gives them a path forward for it. So I'm totally supportive of mm -hmm. it. I think it's a great thing. Thank you for that. And this is just for Walter. So Walter was my um, previous supervisor when I used to work as a college assistant at CCNY. So he's going to love this little shout out. Maybe he'll send me a text like, oh, Saad, you're the best. <laughs> but um, taking a step back, I want to ask you, and I know that you've had a childhood upbringing in education, but what moment made you realize that a career in education was for you? You know, I'm a bad example of that mm. because my father, oh, at, at a certain point, you know, the thing if you're going into college education, mm -hmm. Uh, this question of, are you going to get tenure? Is there going to be job security? Right. It's always been kind of in flux. And he was telling me right up until the day I graduated from college, don't go into academics. It's not <laughs> like, yeah. like it's, the, it's not, it's not, um, it's not going to be stable. Mm -hmm. right? I don't know what the future of, of the institution of college education mm -hmm. is going to be. And then the day I graduated, he said, I might've been wrong about that. So mm -hmm. if that's something you're interested in, you can explore it. I went to graduate school thinking I wanted to be in the Foreign Service, that mm -hmm. I wanted to get into diplomatics. Um, but despite the fact that my father was a professor and had a PhD, mm -hmm. he didn't actually give me any specific guidance <laughs> right. about like how you look for a graduate program. Mm -hmm. So I had played lacrosse in high school and we played a game at Cornell University in their stadium. I was like, wow, this is really cool. Mm -hmm. And just in the back of my head for no good reason, I'm going to say this, for no good reason, don't, don't emulate this. Yeah. For no good reason, like, well, I'll go to Cornell. You know, mm -hmm. it was close to where I lived. Um, I had a girlfriend that lived in Buffalo, so mm -hmm. I wanted to be sort of local. And I went down there thinking, well, you know, a degree is a degree. I'll just get the next step and I'll go join mm -hmm. the Foreign Service. And the first semester, we're going around the room in one of my seminars, and the professor was saying, you know, what do you want to do with your degree? And it came to me, and I said, I want to be in the diplomatic corps. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, well, you know, as if I did know, mm -hmm. you know, you're in the wrong place, which was <laughs> news for me. Yeah. And so I, you know, I, I kind of thought about that a little bit. And um, 
And I thought, well, you know, let me just kind of stay with this. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a politics, I was in a government program. Mm -hmm. I was interested in um, protest and, you know, democracy and dictatorship and, and that whole kind mm -hmm. of nexus. Um, and so I kind of slid into the idea that I was going to be an academic. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it wasn't, I didn't have a moment where I thought mm -hmm. I'm going to be a professor. You know, um, but I also thought that teaching in a college is different than teaching in high school. Right. Like if you're a college professor, there are all these other things you can do while you're teaching. You know, right. you can do research, you can do consulting, you can you can write policy papers, you can mm -hmm. work with governments. And, and I did some of that when I was when I was in the political science department. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. Um, I was talking with uh, the previous guest, uh, Dean Sotosetti. We were talking about how she never wanted to go into education. Yeah. And then I've met so many people who happen to be at very high positions within higher education with the same story. Oh, I never thought I'd be here. So I feel like someone needs to do some study into the pipeline of how do you go from eh, maybe not for me to like being on the top of your game than actually being so about it, you know? Well, but I think mm -hmm. I think you could generalize past that, mm -hmm. right? When I was uh, running the Colin Powell Center and then Dean of the Colin Powell School, we would bring in very successful people in all different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And the one and and a lot of what they would do is talk about their career trajectories. Mm. I don't remember one that said, I want to do this job and then I did that right. job. Right. It's it's all a kind of I thought I was gonna do this mm. and then I, you know, I picked up a post-it from a board and I went and I interviewed and I learned these things mm -hmm. on the job. Things that I think college students don't always know and we don't always tell them That's true. is that you're gonna continue to be educated throughout your professional life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you think you're graduating with a degree that lets you do this job, mm -hmm. but all the jobs you're going to have after that job are going to be based a lot on what you've learned in your work mm -hmm. life, right? So I, I suspect that um, we are no more <laughs> kind of wanderers to yeah. our career destination than, than a lot of people in, 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 in different kinds of work. I feel you. And um, I want to ask you, so as president, what are your long-term vision or long-term vision for the academics, but then also the communal engagement at City College? So let me start with communal, communal mm -hmm. engagement. Um, I believe that we are a kind of frontline community organization, mm. institution. We should be in lockstep with community groups. And the research, the writing, the advocacy, the public events we do here should speak to our community. And the community should feel like this is their place, mm -hmm. right? So we, you know, in college, we bring in a lot of speakers from all over the world to come and address. And too often the audience for those speakers is the college community, which is great. Right. It should be the community community. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I think we should be thinking very, very clearly about how the assets on this campus can be deployed to meet, you know, the urgent needs that humanity is facing. Mm -hmm. So in our sciences and engineering and in the Colin Powell School, we've got a great concentration of focus and capability around questions of climate change mm -hmm. and resiliency. Also the architecture school. Right. Like, like those conversations should be informing how people live and, and how our governments are making decisions. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, that, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when our country had big questions or decisions, they would go to the universities hmm. for answers. And little by little, that's been displaced by think tanks and talking heads and ah, so right, right. recentering the university, but particularly recentering universities like the ones you find in CUNY mm -hmm. that are of the people that are educating the population of New York City. We should be tuned into the issues that drive their lives mm. and, 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 and figuring that out. So that's, that's my vision for mm. our community engagement. My, my vision for academics isn't that different. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, um, you know, I talk to older alumni who will say, you know, City College used to be the Harvard of the, of, mm. of the poor. We are still the Harvard of the poor, <laughs> yeah. right? We are, you know, you go down your list of social mobility mm -hmm. indicators, like all these different studies. It's not always City College on top. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's Baruch and sometimes it's Hunter, but we're always in the top 10 right. nationally. Um, and making, you know, communicating to people, first of all, that, that the work we are doing 
to educate um, people for whom education wasn't necessarily a foregone conclusion mm -hmm. and 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 you know culling and developing their ideas and their insights and their experiences and, and moving those into the public debate that's hugely important to me but the other thing that's important is you know we have an engineering school it's 102 years old mm -hmm. and you know places like stanford and mit and harvard when they have that history of innovation they're also commercializing right that right they're 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 managing intellectual property and mm -hmm. and 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 pulling together researchers who might otherwise be isolated in different laboratories mm -hmm. to say what are we going to do as a campus on a research front about climate change mm -hmm. um we have a colin powell school that is dedicated to to developing leadership and, and you know diversity in leadership mm -hmm. and it's every year it's adding new programs to make that more and more uh, possible so i would like when people i would like for people across the city to be able to imagine city college up at 138th street changing the fabric of new york city both in terms of who we graduate and and what they bring to to their careers and their and their perspectives um, but also in terms of a place where especially um, a certain kind of conversation is convened. Like you don't get a conversation back in the day when we had stop and frisk. Mm -hmm. The conversations we had on this campus about stop and frisk were different because our students were stopped and frisked on the way to college. Right. You know, conversations we have about the place of immigrants in our society is different because everybody on this campus has, you know, either an actual person living with them mm -hmm. that's an immigrant or they're, they're, they're the sons and daughters of immigrants or, you know, it's, it's just different if we're having those conversations. And, and a lot of times the people that populate places like City College and John Jay and Hunter and, and we're not always in those conversations. Right. So I, I just I just see us as an engine of social change. Mm -hmm. And that's that that's baked into our academic mission. And, you know, you mentioned the Colin Powell School of um, Education and or not education, civic and global civic, leadership yeah. <laughs> for a second. I was like, wait, wrong one. But um, as the founding dean of the Colin Powell School, how has that impacted your leadership approach as a president of CCNY? Well, so I will say that I worked with General Powell for mm -hmm. almost almost 20 years wow. and um, sort of watching him you know, run the board and mm -hmm. getting advice from him and sort of strategizing with him was um, was a really important lesson for me. And this, mm -hmm. you know, this Colin Powell school, there wasn't necessarily a lot of support for it on campus. Mm -hmm. You know, we had, um, a lot of people don't know this, the Colin Powell school started because some friends of General Powell said, we have to build a building for you on campus. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. we were gonna build Colin Powell Hall. And, um, it went from us having to raise $12 million. And I'll, it's a long story yeah. with lots of steps. Eventually, they were saying, you've got to raise $81 million mm. to build this building. And I went down <laughs> to General Powell and I said, if we, if we do this, if mm. we raise $81 million, we won't have any more resources to build the programs we want to build inside of it. Oh. So I said, my advice is we abandon this project. And, and I was nervous because mm. I thought I'm going to disappoint him. He was relieved because he thought, well, if I don't raise $81 million for City <laughs> College, I'm going to disappoint yeah. them. And then we said, well, what we can do is we can take the Colin Powell Center. So I'd been running the Colin Powell mm -hmm. Center since 2002. Mm -hmm. And so in that center, we'd built all these programs and uh, service and leadership. And so we had raised about $25 million for the building. And so now we're not going to do the building. What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. I said, let's take that money use it and and the president at the time was supportive of the mm -hmm. idea use it to establish the colin powell school and this money will bankroll things like expanding the scholarships expanding right. the leadership programs and and you know we built the office of student success that mm -hmm. that brought sort of extraordinary supports to students so that that gave me a sense of you know how you build right on campus i've always been i've told you i, I this is my 32nd mm -hmm. year here my first semester, so um, the fall semester of 1991, I was a professor, full stop, mm -hmm. I taught. From that January until now, I've always run something. 
Right. I directed the master's program. I was the chair of the political science program. I directed the um, international studies program. Mm. So, so from early, early on, I was, and everything that I had, I wanted to, to build. Right. Right. So I, I've been a builder on this campus. Being the dean made me think that, you know, the idea behind the Colin Powell School mm -hmm. was that we were going to take this center that I knew should be bigger and, and more prominent. And we we're going to make it like a thing that people could look across the city and say, mm -hmm. oh, I know City College. That's where the Colin Powell School is. Um, it also taught me ambition. You know, I think. I think one of the things that's discouraged me in my 30 decades is that I haven't always, always mm -hmm. been surrounded by people who thought this was the best place in the world to be, ah, I see. right? And when I started working with General Powell, one of the reasons that that was important to me was I thought, if this man will associate himself and his legacy mm -hmm. with this school, and if and 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 by that association bring attention to the work that we're doing, then then we can be the best place, right? right? And I thought that as I was building the Colin Powell School, I, I I think that as 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 president of the college, that 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 we're not day in and day out. We get so burdened by, um, you know, budget difficulties, mm. and the escalator doesn't go all the way to the top, <laughs> and and like all these other things yeah. that we sometimes fail to recognize that the core thing that the founders of the Free Academy wanted to do in 1847, mm -hmm. which was open up educational opportunity. You look at our social mobility numbers today, they back then in the day in the golden age of, of, of City College, and they couldn't have dreamed yeah. that we would be as successful today as we are. And that success is not flashy success, mm -hmm. right? It's not, it's not, um, you know, we've got these great Gothic buildings, but mm -hmm. we've got some buildings that are not so Gothic, right? They're not so, um, it doesn't feel always right. the way you feel when you walk into like a technology center at MIT. Right. Um, but the fundamental work we're doing here, and I would say the work that we're doing in engineering, in sciences, that is absolutely cutting edge technology, mm -hmm. second to none in the nation. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, it gave me a sense that is as, that that one of my biggest missions mm -hmm. as president was to show the college that that this is what we should be we should be the most important educational institution mm -hmm. in the nation and you know there's going to be lots of different ways that you measure what's the most important educational institution i want to be able to look at our yardstick which is our values mm -hmm. our commitments um and say you know based on what we were founded to do mm -hmm. there's never been a place like city college and you know um something i want to focus on the builder aspect as well as the ambition yeah. because what i've realized is that when you actually do have a team surrounding you that does care about the mission the yeah. values as much as you do you realize that you know even if there are difficulties whatever restraints there may be there's always a creative way out of it yeah. but it's kind of like you know um the self-fulfilling prophecy yeah right if you believe that okay I'm only going to be able to do X, Y, and Z, or me and my team will only be able to do X, Y, and Z. Well, that's all, that's the box you're putting yourself in. Yeah. But then when you start to think out the box, and it's funny because that related me to this project where in reality, the, the space, right? Initially, I wanted to rent a WeWork we facility. I was like, oh, how much is it going to be? I took a little tour. I'm like, oh, this is nice. Yeah. And then they gave me the bill at the end. It's like, oh, it's going to be this much. 4,000 a month. I'm like, we're broke. We don't got that money. Right, right, right. And then just having to kind of constantly think of these creative solutions. But for me, I really cared about the program, going through it as a participant, and then now coming back as a full-time staff member, I was like, I have to figure out a way to get this off the ground. Right. But you see, that creativity only happens if you really, really care about something. That's right. So then with that whole builder aspect, I like how you said back then you, you weren't really surrounded by people like that. But then when Colin Powell was like, oh, yeah, I'll attach my name to this, I'll do this, it's kind of like a second win. Like you feel like, yeah, I do want to do these projects because they are near and dear to me. Yeah. But then not only are they near and dear to me, but then you can only imagine the impact that they'll have 20, 30, 40 years down the line. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, the, the, the Colin Powell Center, when they asked me to take it over, mm. was, a, was a room with a plaque on it and no activity. Right? <laughs> yeah. And it had been in existence for five years uh -huh. with, with basically no activity. Every now and then there'd be like a little conference or mm. a little lecture or something like that. 
Um, and so I thought when I took it over, I thought I'm going to do two years worth of activity. Mm. And at that point, General Powell was going to step down as Secretary of State because you know, they usually stay about four years. Right. And so I want to be able to show him a program of activity that will that will draw him in. Mm -hmm. So I already thought that that you know this was a time when there wasn't a lot of philanthropic support for the college, mm -hmm. and we weren't getting a lot of attention. It was just starting to to, to get a little bit more of that that kind of um, attention and support. But I thought. Um, if I can draw him in mm -hmm. with the program that we're doing, then then we can get to it at a whole different level. Mm -hmm. And and you know, fortunately, he was enthusiastic as enthusiastic as as you could have hoped for. Mm -hmm. so. And that's the one thing that I, well, for me, I don't know what was happening behind the scenes, but how did he get involved with um, City College in the first place? Oh, well, he graduated from City College. Mm. He's a, he's a graduate in 1958. Um, he was uh, given an honorary degree in 1991. Mm -hmm. Um, in 1997, mm -hmm. they wanted to name a Colin Powell Center, and he basically gave them permission to mm -hmm. use his name, but he wasn't involved. Mm -hmm. And so it was my project to to draw him in and get him involved. Right. So you won't see this on camera, but on the wall back there is a picture of the president at the time, Greg Williams, mm -hmm. and me with less gray hair and General Powell. <laughs> And the eight yeah. original Colin Powell Fellows. Oh, that one right there. Right? That one right there. Ah. So these were eight students mm -hmm. that when 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 we started the program, we started the program. It wasn't a student scholarship and leadership program. Mm -hmm. I, I it, it you know they were doing some conferences, they were doing some stipends to faculty. Right. Um, but I had read his book, My American Journey, mm -hmm. and one of the things he said in that book is, "My whole career, I've been." Um, developing the talents of young people. He mm. meant, you know, as, a, as an officer in the military, in the State Department. And it just seemed like if I was going to enlist his support, mm. it would make sense to do something that he had, that he thought was important. And I would say at that point, I had been on campus for about a little over a decade. Mm -hmm. And I had all these students who were working you know, when I first came in in the early 1990s, we mm -hmm. used to say that the average city college student worked an average of 30 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And I would think, man, if I was working 30 hours a week when I was a student, like there's no way you would have gotten my best work. <laughs> right. Right. And at that time, there were very, very few scholarships on campus, mm -hmm. almost none. So I thought if I could take the budget of the Colin Powell mm -hmm. Center and turn it over mostly to student scholarships, mm -hmm. we would at least begin to see what talents our students had that were being masked by the fact that they were falling asleep in class because they worked all right. night and they had kids they were taking care of and all the things that complicate the lives mm -hmm. of our students. So that was really the beginning of a period at City College where we started more and more to devote and were successful in raising mm -hmm. money to support student scholarships. Um, in 2016, we gave out $3 million in scholarships and, and that kind of support to students. Mm -hmm. Last year we gave out ten and a half million dollars. Damn. So mm -hmm. so that's and that's and I will say when we started the Colin Powell mm -hmm. Center, we probably gave out um, eight or eight or nine hundred thousand dollars campus wide mm -hmm. in scholarship support to students. So that's really been a change on, mm -hmm. on campus over the years. And uh, I guess that segues me to my next question, which is you or Damn, I just messed up because I had like one question in mind, but then I was like, wait, which one should I go to first? But I want to ask you, how do you personally handle the responsibilities and I guess sometimes the mounting pressures as being the city college president? Uh -huh. And then the two part is what's the most rewarding parts of being the president and then the most challenging? So I'm pretty I got I, like I'm pretty chill. Mm -hmm. So I don't get stressed out a lot. I don't lose my temper very much. Mm -hmm. Um I will say that when I've got to decompress, mm -hmm. I get in my kayak, I go fly fishing, <laughs> yeah. I get out, you know. Um, you know, you've got to, you got to, when, when, when the stress is mount, you've got to go back to values and mission. Like right. there's a reason why I'm doing this work, right? I probably could have had a more relaxed mm -hmm. decade if I was, if I stayed in the classroom and, and, and was a, a faculty member, but I had ambitions for this campus. Mm -hmm. I had ambitions for our students and their lives. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so that is, so you, add, so the, that's the flip side of the question, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, so yes, I have ways of, of coping recreation mm -hmm. and, 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 and that kind of stuff. Um, but if you keep the mission in mind mm -hmm. 
then that becomes the other stress relief, right. right? Like I'm at a stage right now where students I've taught are all over the world. Mm -hmm. you know, doing stuff. The Adonis Rodriguez, the commissioner, the transportation oh, commissioner, uh -huh. he was my student in my first Seriously? year for huh. lots of my classes. Um, one of the original uh, Colin Powell fellows mm. there is a guy named Trevor Hauser, who was the energy policy advisor on the Hillary Clinton presidential campaign. Mm. And now he's one of the one of the partners in a, in a group called the Rhodium Group that's doing great work in right. energy and climate change and, and that kind of work. So you start to see and you know the other thing is I, I'll one of my jobs as president is mm -hmm. to go around the country and meet with groups of, of alumni. Uh -huh. So I'm down in Houston and a woman steps through the crowd, and she was one of the original, not original first cohort, mm -hmm. but she was a Colin Powell fellow from you know probably 2015, and now she's down there with her with her little baby and mm -hmm. her husband, and she's uh, she's a doctor and she's doing a residency down at a, a medical place, and I go, you know, to. Uh, 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 you know, San Francisco, and there's two of my other students that are there. And you start mm -hmm. to get a sense of your work, which I think really takes time. It takes a, mm -hmm. it takes a kind of time. And I've been blessed by being in the same institution for my mm -hmm. whole career. You get to see the impact of your work, not just on what, what happens tomorrow or the day after mm -hmm. the day after. You get to see it in the lives of, 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 of students. And that's, I mean, there's nothing like that as an educator. There's nothing mm -hmm. like seeing somebody come back to you 10 years later, 20 years later and say, you know, maybe even something that came out of your mouth that mm -hmm. you weren't even thinking, like that thing you said in yeah. class <laughs> that changed how I thought about that. So really, mm -hmm. I said that, hmm, well, it's pretty good. I'll have to write that down, yeah. say it again sometime. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I'm waiting for that. Oh, I have a little bit happen like that or a little moments like that because when I'm 25. So the biggest instance I have is when some guy told me, oh, do you remember when you taught me how to steal those snacks in like kindergarten? That's mm -hmm. my, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, that's my creme de la creme in terms of my teaching achievements now. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll, uh -huh. you'll, you'll see it. I mean, it's hard to be patient for it. Mm -hmm. Wait 20 years. Wait, wait when a full adult mm. comes back to you and says, you know, this thing that you said or you did or you, you, rec or you noticed me. Mm. I think this is important. I, I say this to our faculty all the time, but I think it's important at all levels of education. Mm -hmm. Like the mere act of noticing a student yeah. and saying, you know, you're, you're good at this or, um, or, uh, or something's going on in the student's life mm -hmm. and I need to provide a kind of safe space for them, a little bit of sanctuary and some attention. Like you, you, though that's like the work of days right. right every day you do that kind of stuff and and sometimes that just becomes kind of an element of the job mm -hmm. and then somebody comes back 20 years later and they're an adult and mm -hmm. they say you know you may not remember this but you said you know you're a good writer and i just wrote a book right you know i wouldn't have written this book if when i was a little kid you didn't tell me i was a writer because after that in my head i carried around the fact mm -hmm. that i'm a writer mm -hmm. It's it's just that's those are the rewards yeah. and they get paid out over decades, not not in, in years and weeks. Mm -hmm. I think. And it's interesting you mentioned that because um, I've had a lot of experiences in my life where for me, math, I've always had a touchy like relationship with. I always thought I sucked at math. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned the uh, Grove School of Engineering because that's where I initially started at. I was like, oh, let me do civil engineering. I realized, I, listen, math, I don't know about this thermodynamics, all that. Nah. Just like General Paul. <laughs> but yeah. then a couple years later, um, during the midst of the pandemic, when I was starting my first business, I realized, well, finance math, I love. Yeah. But the thing is, I never really discounted to myself truly because in high school one of my math teachers I, I, I was bad I was getting 55 I was flunking and he's like no we can get you to be at a better place so he'd come in super early and stay late to tutor me yep. now now I'm older I realize he wasn't even getting paid per session to do all that he's doing that pro bono right. but the fact that he did that gave me the confidence boost to then get good scores in the subsequent semesters but then really reevaluate my relationship with math yep. now that's why I was like, oh, let me do civil engineering. Of course, then I realized, all right, this is the type of math that maybe I might not have an affinity for. But then when it came to financial math, I was like, oh, I have an affinity for this. This is mm -hmm. something that I like. So it's still within that same realm, just a different specialty. Yeah. But then I'd always think about how he'd say, don't say that you're bad at math. Don't say that you suck at it. You're actually really good at it. You just have to apply it in a different way. Yep. And the real key component of that is we had a final project where we had to like look at real world applications of math. So I did something on like, you know, cellular towers and like how that like math translates into our phones or something of that nature. And then it really made me think that, okay, it's not as archaic as I'm thinking it to be. Mm -hmm. There's so many different avenues I can take, but of course the self-fulfilling prophecy. If you discount yourself before you even go to the race, how are you going to run? That's right. 
That's exactly right. And 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 for educators, knowing that you have that power, mm. which also means like we're all going to have a bad day, but, yeah. you, but you can't have a bad day. Yeah. Right. Because if you've got the power to lift up a student, you've also got the power to, to, to knock them down. Mm. And so so making sure that that you're you know, you're so aware of the impact you're having on the lives of the people that mm -hmm. you that you come in contact with. Thank you for that. And, you know, we're nearing the end of the segment. So I want to ask you, um, I guess, like two questions. One being, this is like kind of like the philosophical question, but what what advice would you offer to aspiring is anyone and like career professionals, collegiate students, high school students, just words of wisdom? Pay attention. <laughs> Pay attention all the time. Yeah. Because, you know, I talked earlier about these um, these conversations we would have about mm. um, career trajectories. I can't tell you how many times somebody in retrospect talking about something that literally made their career hinging on the oh. fact that like they walked by a bulletin board and out of the corner mm -hmm. of their eye they saw something or somebody said to them hey do you, would you want to do this thing that mm -hmm. had nothing to do with what they were doing and they did it and nothing else was was the same i um you know for in some ways uh, mm -hmm. what what pulled me once and for all off my kind of regular academic trajectory mm -hmm. was the Colin Powell Center. Right. And I got involved with the Colin Powell Center. One day I was crossing the street from NAC to, um, I think to Shepherd Hall. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the vice president of development saw me and said, would you like to be the director of the Colin Powell Center? <laughs> yeah. Right. And the Colin Powell Center hadn't had any activity for a while. Mm -hmm. So it looked like it was kind of a, um, it looked like it was like a what would you call it like a it was a bad deal yeah. to get involved with this thing and i asked yeah. a bunch of people and i said you know what, what do you think they're like oh, don't get involved with that mm -hmm, and nothing's mm -hmm. ever going to happen with the colin powell center mm -hmm. um but i paid attention and mm -hmm. i and i thought about you know what it would look like if i could do this thing if i could uh if i had the resources to build a student leadership program which we didn't have at the time and if I had the opportunity to attract the attention mm -hmm. of some powerful external supporters to City College, because mm -hmm. I always knew that City College, I mean, you weren't you weren't here mm -hmm. in those days. I mean, when I the first decade I was here, there wasn't a blade of grass on campus. Really? Huh. There wasn't any place to get a cup of coffee except for the student cafeteria. Mm -hmm. And that was not good coffee. <laughs> um, faculty members would, um, you know, at that time, everybody was so demoralized. Mm -hmm. And so they would come and they would teach their classes and go home, you know. So thinking, well, maybe this is an opportunity to do something that's gonna be different, you know, that, that you know, to gather a group of students and really invest in their success mm -hmm. and see where that leads. So I would just say, pay attention and understand that, that whatever you might've imagined, your lives, your careers are probably not gonna be linear. Right. And so you always have to look for the thing that's going to get you to the next thing, mm -hmm. even if it's even if it's something that you don't feel like you've got expertise in. Mm -hmm. Pay attention. And, you know, the whole it's funny because uh, Basilio and I yesterday we were talking to a group of like incoming freshmen at Hunter College yesterday. And that was like a similar advice I gave them, which was kind of like make sure you take every opportunity that's available yeah. to you. Because even looking at my own personal journey, I wanted to do engineering, then law. I even took the LSAT and then yeah. education. But it was all these touch points that I had where it was like similar, like you were saying, one little instance that yeah. didn't relate at all. But I was like, screw it, why not? why not? The way I looked at it is I have really nothing to lose. I'm like 18, 19, 20. And at this point, it's either going to be a blip in the radar or it'll have lasting impact, you know, eh, for decades to come. Mm -hmm. But then looking at that, I have realized that the whole paying attention piece as well. When I was teaching during the pandemic, I've noticed children's, their attention spans have started to get smaller, especially after the pandemic and yeah. with the rise of short form media like TikTok, Instagram Reels, etc. Yeah. But I really feel like that point should be hammered into students nowadays yeah. because again sometimes even if you're like looking on your phone on campus or whatever you're gonna miss like these bulletin boards you're gonna miss the little piece of paper a flyer whatever it right, is right. to direct you to where your journey could actually take you yeah yeah and 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 pay attention i mean pay attention even more broadly than that like mm. pay attention to the impact that you have on people yeah. you know pay attention to the people around you who who maybe need something from you and, mm. and make sure you you give it so yeah and with that being said i got my final well it's not a question or well, actually i guess it's a question and i've and i always ask this to every guest it's kind of been like a traditional question at this point okay which is if you could go back in time and do anything differently would you that's a really good question uh 
That's a really good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think we. I'm happy where I am. Mm -hmm. I think I'm doing the work I'm I meant to do. And did I make mistakes? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I think those mistakes were contributory to to where I am now. Um, I think as president, mm -hmm. there's some things that I tried that didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. So if I could go do a do over, uh -huh. um, I think there are some decisions that took me a while to get mm -hmm. to. And if I could have gotten to them earlier, that might have saved me some grief and saved the campus some grief. Right. But um, if you're talking about like the long path, mm -hmm. you know, I probably would have broken up with my college girlfriend a little bit <laughs> earlier. You know, yeah. but in the in the general mix of things, uh -huh. I I um I think if you're happy with where you are, mm. then it's probably a mistake to go back and try to re-engineer the path yeah. that that brought you to to where you're at. So, I know, you know that's a funny point because even for me, the older I get, and it's funny sometimes when I say the older I get, but then I, me and Basilio, sometimes we look back, we're like, wait, we almost graduated high school like almost ten years ago. But then I realized that honestly, I've had a lot of goals in my life. I've had a lot of things that I've wanted to do where I've wanted to get towards. Mm -hmm. But I've slowly and more so starting to realize that it really isn't about the destination at all, but more so the journey and the things that I did to get there that really mm -hmm. make you into who you are. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's exactly right. Um, and I think if we also embrace the idea that our lives are not going to be linear, uh -huh. then what looks like mistakes are just it's like building blocks. Mm -hmm. right? As like Bob Ross says, happy little mistakes or happy little accidents, something yeah, of that happy nature. Little accidents, that's right. <laughs> but with that being said, before we wrap up the segment, I want you to be able to uh, shout out any sponsors, stakeholders, whoever you want to your personal camera, which is that one right there. That's my personal camera. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, I just want to say hi to the City College community. I'm I'm uh, uh, I'm thrilled to be working in this place, um, and I'm surrounded by people that are super dedicated to 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 this. I also said one more thing. Yeah, I know you're going. You're making mm -hmm. the rounds of the CUNY campuses, mm -hmm. right? I'm surrounded by the most talented presidents and and we're you know we have this strange relationship right we're individual campuses but we're also this unified university and what i've seen in my seven years in in in, in this office is there is a ton of support mm. um, from different campuses all trying to get to the same place which is you know being the premier institution that educates the population of New York City. So shout out to all of my, my, my good colleagues. <laughs> and thank you for that. With that being said, uh, I really, really do appreciate you coming on for this episode. It's had a special place in my heart because now I can have a little frame on my office where it's just like, oh, look, I interviewed the college or my alma mater's president. Yes, you did. But with that being said, thank you so much for coming on. That wraps up episode eight of Education in Color. We'll see you guys next time for episode nine. Take care. Mm -hmm.